everyone. Sorry for the wait. Uh, having a few, uh, had a few uh, technical difficulties, so thank you for your patience. Um, if you could please kindly turn your video off if you are not a speaker. Uh, we have Kimberly Tignor who will be leading our workshop today. We have Janina Whitberg, who is our ASL interpreter. And let me unmute Kimberly so she can say something. <laughs> uh, uh, oh, she can hear me. Kimberly? I can hear everybody. This is wonderful. <laughs> Look at technology, right? <laughs> All right. Thank you, Ed, for that idea. Yay, Ed. Thank you. Thank you, Ed. <laughs> so, all right. Um, so I see Jalen is on here, and I was trying to find um, Sandra. Is Sandra in the way? If Sandra is in, uh, I, I can find her, and we'll um, turn her video on. Is Sandra talking first? Um, I mean, we're, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a joint conversation, but we can okay. certainly get started as we look for Sandra. I'm going to send her a quick message to make sure she's um, on the line. Um, well, she's trying to log in. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. All right. But to that point, so I'll just get started and we Yes, and I'm going to go away. So I'll still be here monitoring chats and whatnot. Y'all have fun. <laughs> perfect. Perfect. Okay. Well, so everyone, I am really excited to be talking to you guys today. My name is Kim Tignor. I am the executive director for the Institute for Intellectual Property and Social Justice. Just to give you a better sense of my background, I um, was actually with the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights um, prior to joining IIPSJ, where I did a lot of work in the traditional uh, civil rights, um, in the traditional civil rights space. And um, I started working more in the intellectual property space as part of our economic empowerment and economic justice portfolio. And I have to tell you, I, I fell in love with the work because what became really clear to me was that there was still so much work and so much potential to be done as far as empowering um, our great creators and really being able to, by empowering and creating their, their capacity that we would actually be able to one, bring more money into um, marginalized communities and be able to drive culture in a really positive way. Um, so I started doing more work with the Institute for Intellectual Property and Social Justice and eventually decided that I wanted to really fully focus myself on empowering creators. Um, and so we developed a, an initiative called Take Creative Control and you can find it takecreativecontrol.org. Um, where we do a lot of work in different communities. We go to different cities across the country, um, now virtually, but in a real life world, we would literally go to cities and do pop-ups when we would have real conversations about how intellectual property systems directly impact um, the, uh, the creator community. Um, and when I say creators, I'm talking about visual artists, musicians, entrepreneurs, small business owners, um, it's the entire, it's just anyone who's basically um, carrying creative expression um, and monetizing it. And so we just really wanted to focus on empowering that community. Um, and so as a result of that work, I've had the opportunity to work with, you know, some of the other panelists that are on us today um, and who really also embody that, that mission and that purpose. <laughs> Of empowering creators. Um, and so first up, we have Jalen Johnson, who's here from the Copyright Office. And she, uh, I've had the honor of working with her office over at the Copyright Office, just to kind of think through how we're making sure that um, we're sharing the really important work and resources that are available at the Copyright Office. I think that a lot of folks see it as this big, mysterious building and don't realize how accessible and how ready they are to help the public and help creators. Um, and so, you know, Jalen and her entire team, they're constantly thinking through, how do we get, the, get our resources out? How do we get our message out? Um, and so she really is someone who embodies that entire idea of empowering creators. And I always get excited whenever I get to be on a panel with that HU alum. 
uh, just as a, you know, as a Washingtonian, you know, HU was everything. And, um, you know, our institute has had the honor of working a lot um, and closely. Our founder is a professor over at, um, at HU. So it's always excited to, exciting to have a, be on a panel with, with one of our alums. Um, and Sandra is actually, I think she's in the waiting room. I will introduce Sandra when she's, um, she's on. I just turned her video on. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> See, we wanted you to have a grand entrance. That was, it was just, yeah. So it's just like a, a grand song. enough. <laughs> and so Sandra is someone else who have, I've had an honor of working with and get to know as we've been doing this work in the um, social justice space. And so, so Sandra is a professor over at GMU Law. And, um, you know, their clinic is also doing a lot of interesting stuff as far as outreach and empowering creators as well. So, you know, true to form, these ladies are really, you know, putting action where their intentions are and really um, um, working to, to empower and, and bring that social justice lens to the intellectual property space. So I'm really excited to have you guys uh, on the line today. And so I'll just open up the discussion. Um, I'm going to start with Sandra, if that's okay. But, you know, Jalen, I want you, you know, as I told you guys both, you know, I feel like we're all friends in the IP space. So you guys should definitely just jump in, um, you know, if you have anything that you want to add. Um, you know, so Sandra, I would love for you to just give um, the folks on the line just like a really quick 101 on IP. Um, just some of the things that thinking about the fact that we have a lot of visual artists and creatives on the line, um, just give them a, a quick on a one on one on some of the things that they should be thinking about um, as they want to share and, um, and, and monetize their work. Absolutely. So let me just give you um, three big things to know about copyright law, um, especially as visual artists. And I'm particularly happy to be doing this because I am the daughter of a visual artist, uh, a middle-class guy. I'm from an immigrant family, and my dad supported us and sent me and my uh, little sister to college um, with the income from being an artist and being a, a, an art professor, ultimately, um, as well. So I uh, know what it's like. Um, all right, three things to know. So copyright protects original works of authorship that are fixed in a tangible medium. Um, what does that mean? So an original work, that means that your work has been created independently. It has not been copied by somebody else, copied from somebody else. Um, it doesn't mean that the work has to be absolutely novel. So if you have two artists who independently create something that is substantially similar um, without copying from each other, both of those works would be protected by copyright. Um, all right, it's an original work of authorship. What does authorship mean? Authorship does not mean idea, it means expression. So you can't copyright the idea of say, painting a field of sunflowers, or even the idea of painting a series of fields of sunflowers on different colored backgrounds. Um, but the uh, precise rendering of that work, the nuances of brush stroke, the layering of the paint on the canvas, the painterliness of the work, um, those are all elements of your expression as a visual artist. And those are elements that can be protected. Um, a work has to be fixed in a tangible medium in order to be protected by copyright. Um, what does that mean? Fixed means that it is fixed on a tangible medium like paper or canvas, but it could also be fixed in a digital medium like on your hard drive or on, uh, you know, as a digital image somewhere. Um, if all those elements are met, you have a protected work, a work protected by copyright. And that gives you a variety of rights as a visual artist. You can reproduce a work. You can authorize the making of derivative works. You can distribute copies of your work. You can display your work publicly. 
Um, and those are all and very those important rights important. that allow you to make economic um, use of your work and to license your work to other people to earn a living from your creative uh, pursuits. Um, second thing to know, you don't have to do anything formal to get copyright protection. Um, as much as I love Jalen and the Copyright Office, you don't have to go and register your work with her in order for copyright protection to exist in your work. It exists from the moment in time where you set it down on that tangible or intangible medium. Um, but you may very well want to go visit my friend Jalen because um, there are additional rights that you gain by registering a work for copyright protection and it also makes it easier for people to find you if they want to license your work for use in their commercial ventures. Um, so it's, it's a good practice to do and I'm sure Jalen can tell you uh, how to go about registering a work and, and what you have to submit if you're a visual artist. You might be sitting at home saying, oh my God, do I have to send her my painting to register it? No, <laughs> you don't have to do that. And I'm sure she can tell you uh, exactly what is required. Uh, more like an image of your painting, not the painting itself. Um, the third thing, and one thing that you really will love to hear, I think, is that when you sell a copy of the work, even if it's the only copy that you've ever created, you are not selling the copyright in the work. You are selling the work itself. You're not transferring the rights to make copies of the work and print them up on t-shirts and on uh, postcards and to sell them on the internet to whoever buys the copy of your work, um, unless you enter into a separate agreement with that person. So you, as the copyright owner in the work, retain the copyright. And that's a very important right for visual artists to retain. Um, so those are the three things that I, uh, that I think uh, I want to send you out into the world with as visual artists knowing. Um, and then the fourth thing that I'll tell you, which um, I just want you to keep in the back of your mind because it's important to think about as you are exercising your rights as a visual artist and as you're creating your work, um, is this concept of fair use. And I'm sure we'll talk about it as we uh, talk about the issues that come up in, in our work with artists. Um, and fair use can be your friend. Um, and fair use can also, I suppose, be your frenemy, uh, depending on how you go about uh, engaging in uh, employing that concept. But I'll just leave it here and we can talk about fair use more when all three of us are talking. You're muted, Kimberly. Perfect. No, thanks, Sandra. So, but I think you teed it up perfectly to just, um, for Jalen to talk a little bit about, or know a lot about, you know, all of the great things that the Copyright Office, um, the a Copyright Office is doing for the public. And I think also what I would love to kind of explore is to think, I, I would love to hear about some of the things that you guys are thinking about at the Copyright Office in like a virtual world, um, mm -hmm. you know, and how folks should be mindful of these things as well. Okay, great. Thanks. Sounds good. So um, happy to be here. Thank you to Kim for reaching out. <laughs> See you a little again. <laughs> um, and always happy to join in a conversation with Kim and, and Sandra. We've, um, I think, done a little bit of work with your law students in your clinic, uh, helping out on some projects at the Copyright Office um, related to doing some research on artificial intelligence and how that might be affected or how that might, how the copyright law might intersect and what are some considerations there. So really great to be joining the two of you. So I'll just give you all just a little bit about um, sort of what we do at the Copyright Office, uh, who we are, how we can help, um, you know, what services we offer. Cause like Kim said, a lot of people, you know, may think of like, oh, the Copyright Office, like this big, scary, you know, federal agency, red tape, bureaucracy, and all of those things. But we really want people to understand that we are here to serve the public. Um, 
that's a, a primary goal of ours. And so actually today, um, so we've been serving, I have to do a plug, we've been serving the public for 150 years. Um, we're celebrating our 150-year anniversary um, today, and we're really excited about that because with our 150th um, anniversary, while we have definitely done some looking to the history of the Copyright Office and where we came from, it's also caused us to sort of look to our future. You know, where do we want to be in the next 150 years? And I think a lot of that involves being more accessible and having ways that people can come to us or we can go to people and provide these types of information and services that um, will be helpful to the public at large. So I'll just go over a little bit about what we do and then I'll talk some of what we, what we don't do because there are some um, misconceptions there. So the Copyright Office, we're the primary agency in charge with administering the copyright law. So basically that's sort of like a fancy way of saying that we um, we sort of implement um, certain administrative aspects of the law. And so we do that by advising Congress. If Congress has questions on copyright matters, they generally can come to the Copyright Office and ask for um, information and advice. And so we serve that role. We also do rulemaking that relate to the different copyright procedures, um, regulatory issues that may need to be addressed. The Copyright Office is in charge of implementing those regulations and doing whatever research and public outreach um, there's a noticing and comment that is involved with most of, most of those rulemaking. So the Copyright Office facilitates that process. Then we also are involved in litigation efforts. If there's a reason for the Copyright Office to be involved in um, any type of litigation, our office does that. Uh, policy reports, those relate to those. Sometimes Congress coming, asking the Copyright Office, we need more information on this. We're considering um, something related to copyright, perhaps for some new legislation. We've been hearing from stakeholders that this is a problem, this is an issue. Copyright Office, can you research this and let us know how this is impacting the copyright community? And so our office will do those types of policy reports. Then we also serve on international delegations, doing something similar, but just for an international um, community and sort of representing the United States voice in the copyright space. And one thing that may be particularly interesting to this audience, and I kind of um, saved the best for last, if you will, is we administer the nation's registration and recordation system. So as was mentioned, you are not required to register your work for the Copyright Office, but you do get certain additional benefits if you do that. And um, Sandra touched really nicely on those. Well, I don't want to take up our time repeating them, but um, definitely if we can talk more about specifics about how to register, what you need to do, what websites you need to go to, or website, what website, there is one website, <laughs> I, I, want, I want that to be clear, um, then we can talk more specifically about that. But before I sort of end my spiel, I want to give you all some resources because um, that's one thing that I think is very important, that people know what resources are available and that you know how to access them. So with our 150-year anniversary I mentioned earlier, we've um, launched a new initiative called Engage Your Creativity, where we really made an effort to try to take some of the resources that we already have and curate them in a way that will be really engaging and informational and easily accessible to sort of everyday people, creators who may not be uh, copyright scholars or academics or copyright attorneys, but you just need information about how to protect your work, how to, um, you know, what rights do you have, how can you use other work. So that type of information is on our Engage Your Creativity page. And so I think um, we have some links to that. And then our website in general. Um, our website can be a little bit overwhelming because there is a lot of information there. But on our website, I would specifically direct you to our circulars, which are sort of these um, handbooks, if you will, of uh, pointed information on various topics. We do have one that's um, specifically related to photographs and photography. We have another, um, I don't know if there are any like, other types of creatives here, but we have one on music and sound recordings. And so we have all of the information sort of breaking down and broken down into um, digestible chunks, if you will. Um, if you're more of a deep dive person, we have our Compendium of Copyright Office Practices, which is also available on our website. And um, Fair Use was mentioned earlier. We have a Fair Use Index, which sort of gives 
really nice um, one-page summaries of fair use cases. Um, again, this is if you sort of want to go deeper in your learning and understanding. It's not as high level as some of our other information, but it is there. Um, you wouldn't have to read an entire case. You could say read the one page or, or the summary of it. Um, and then I want to mention our social media, which is something that's relatively new for us. So we have a YouTube page, which we're really excited about. We launched our copyright learning engine series, which um, is a series of videos on different subjects. Um, copyright subjects. We have one on fair use. We have one on public domain. We have one on general what is copyright. Um, we have one coming out soon about copyright myths, some of the things that people believe about copyright that are not necessarily true. Um, so we have one addressing some of those common um, myths. And then we have a Twitter. Uh, we have a blog. I could just go on and on. We have so much information. <laughs> We're really trying to make efforts to uh, make the information accessible um, because copyright is for everybody and everybody is affected by copyright. So everybody should easily know about it, uh, at least on a, on a, on a general, general scale. So with that, I will stop there and we can talk more in depth um, about other things. Well, wait, Jalen, before you sign off, I'm curious, like what, what are, what's one of the most compelling or interesting myths that you, that you guys have seen or wanted to dispel over at the Copyright Office? Oh gosh, one? Uh, well, I think one that really hits home with us especially is the, uh, the, the idea of the poor man's copyright. And it's this idea that you can sort of, as a substitute for registering your copyrighted work with the Copyright Office, you can just um, somehow timestamp it in a, in the digital world. I've, I've seen emails to yourself back in the day before, like email was really like a thing that everybody does. It was you put it, you actually put it in the mail in a sealed envelope. You don't open it, you mail it to yourself, and that serves as your sort of registration, so to speak, as proof that, you know, you're the copyright owner and you're, you know, you created this work on this date and you don't open up the, the package or you don't open up the envelope until, I guess, you need it in court. Um, so that's one of the myths that we dispel. It does not replace registration, um, that method of, I guess that would be preserving evidence dates. You know, I, I, I honestly have not ever really un fully understood the, the um, purpose of the poor man's copyright myself. So uh, but that is a myth that we dispel in our video. Another one is sort of like if I just find something on the Internet now with our digital age and our ease of access to information and content, a lot of people think, you know, well, I found it on Google, so that means I can use it. You know, they don't really think about copyright or they think it's not protected by copyright. So that's another myth that we touch on, you know, we say just because you found something, just because you were able to have access to it does not necessarily mean that it's not um, copyright protected or that it doesn't have rights associated with that particular work. You still want to do some research to find out, um, you know, perhaps who that author is, who that owner is, if it's protected by copyright, if so, if you need permission to use it. Um, if your use it may be a fair use, that's another consideration. But you shouldn't automatically jump to, I found it, it's free to use without any legal restrictions. And then so I, I'm going to do a quick housekeeping point. Um, one is, is that I've been putting links into for resources and things that the ladies have shared with me that they kind of that both Sandra and Jalen have going on at their offices. Um, and they're great resources. I hope you guys are able to access them. I'm seeing in the chat that people are having mixed um, success. So I'm gonna send all these links to Natalie afterwards and hopefully we'll be able to troubleshoot a way to just send out the links to everybody who participated today. So I just wanted to put that out. Um, but then I also wanted to follow up with Sandra and here, you know, I know that, you know, GMU, you guys have an amazing um, clinic program and um, activities that are actually, you know, directed towards the community. And so I was wondering, you know, what you guys were doing, um, you know, in that space. Absolutely, yeah. So um, I've been a practicing lawyer for over 20 years. Um, and prior to coming to teach at George Mason and 
um, I uh, came to George Mason specifically to start up a arts and entertainment clinic. Um, and what we do there is represent individuals and artists, um, small businesses in the arts space. And we, you know, counsel them on their copyright issues. Um, we, uh, I work with a group of up to six students every semester, and uh, we select cases. Obviously, we can't take on too much work because we're a small group, and we work within the semester system, um, which you know provides some natural limitations, unfortunately, on how much work we can take on, and there's always so much <laughs> that we would like to do. Uh, but we take on as much as we can, and we work with organizations like Washington Area Lawyers for the Arts um, to provide advice and counseling to the arts community here in the DMV. Um, and we do everything from, you know, just giving basic copyright advice to helping people understand contracts that they may have been presented, um, to helping people, you know, clear rights for work that they might want to use in their work. Um, uh, we can't do litigation because we're just not set up for it. Litigation is very lengthy, time-consuming, and expensive. But um, we do some advocacy work as well um, to benefit artists and their interests. Um, and as I say, we work also with Washington Area Lawyers for the Arts, which is also a fantastic organization. Um, and I think, uh, uh, Kimberly, you've sent out a link to their uh, website. And... Um, they actually are dropping um, all membership fees at the moment for artists. So you can sign up for free and they provide um, uh, free advice to people who qualify for their pro bono services um, as small businesses and independent artists. And they'll pair you with lawyers in the community um, who have volunteered to uh, provide counseling. And the lawyers who work with WALA provide counseling not just on copyright issues, which is what I focus on, but um, I'm on the WALA board and we've got lawyers who have signed up to provide advice on pretty much any issue because we recognize that artists need advice on everything from lawyer tenant uh, sorry, lawyer, um, tenant, uh, um, landlord issues, and, uh, you know, anything that might come up. I mean, we actually recently counseled a band who was providing free uh, neighborhood socially distanced concerts um, in the, on like Saturday evenings, unamplified, and uh, on what sort of, you know, requirements might apply to what they were doing. And so, you know, all sorts of stuff comes up, um, some of it having to do with copyright, some of it not. So I encourage you to take uh, advantage of the opportunities. And um, they also provide a great deal of educational services. So they'll, you know, help you through anything from starting up a small business, doing all the incorporation work that you need to do, registering as a 501c3, uh, understanding tax implications, um, all sorts of stuff like that. And resources are available um, online right now. Um, rather than having to go out and sit through a seminar, you can do it all as we are here. <laughs> so. And so, and I, again, I'd say I shared the Walla link in the chat, but we'll afterwards. Um, but I did want to ask both of you um, if there were, what type of, you know, missteps have you seen um, common, you know, cautionary tales that you would like to share with visual, visual artists? Um, you know, I'll share a couple of things, but uh, actually one other thing that I'll mention before I do that, which I should have said, is um, we are actually doing an event with Walla on October 27th, which will be an online clinic that my clinic will be sponsoring. It's on a Tuesday evening from 4 to 6 p.m. Um, so if people are interested in coming with copyright questions um, and having a, you know, private 20-minute 
session with one of my students um, or myself or any of the mentors that we're working with. Um, we'll be doing that online that evening. So uh, get in touch after the session. Um, in terms of missteps for visual artists, I mean, they're the same as for everybody else. You know, people are, you know, they're artists, they're not lawyers, right? So, you know, you aren't really sure what you can and can't use. You see something that you think you want to incorporate in your work. Um, you know, fair use can be the tough one, I think, right? I mean, fair use exists so that artists can build and comment on existing works in their own work and in so doing add to our cultural dialogue and, you know, engage with one another in, um, in you know, artistic um, conversations, right? But what seems like an artistic conversation to you might not seem like an artistic conversation to the person whose work you're commenting on. Um, or maybe you choose to comment on somebody's work who is particularly litigious or, uh, you know. Um, and so those are the areas where people sometimes run into run into problems because there aren't bright lines. There's not a set rule of you can use this much, but no more. Um, and so artists are trying to make the best decisions they can. And sometimes, you know, you, you know, don't make the decision that the court thinks you should have made or that the other artist thinks you should have made. Um, but that's why the resources that Jalen mentions on uh, the Copyright Office website are useful. There are also other, you know, other organizations. Um, the other one that I gave you to send out can, uh, was the Copyright Alliance, um, and they've got great resources for artists as well. Um, so I, I encourage people to check that out too. Another thing that I notice, and this might not come up as much with visual artists um, because perhaps there's a little bit less collaboration on jointly created works as there is in other uh, disciplines, but what comes up so frequently for us are um, cases where people have uh, created a work jointly, you know, the, uh, the collaboration is going really well, or they think it's going to go really well, and they don't put anything in writing about how they're going to yeah. work together. Yeah. And then something goes awry, yeah. or there's a disagreement about what they're going to do with the work once it's completed. Yeah. And uh, because there's nothing in writing, they are joint owners of a work. And the copyright law has joint owners um, sharing the ability to license the work, um, basically like they're joint tenants in, in a real estate you know, um, transaction, right? So they can do whatever they want with the work as long as they account to the other owner for what they've done. So. I'll tell you that might sound very nice and reasonable um, under the law, but if you're pissed off at your artistic partner and your artistic partner wants to license it for some commercial use you disagree with, or heaven forbid some political use you disagree with, um, and you want to prevent them from doing that, that's what comes up. Uh, not that people are like, oh, okay, great. We'll just, you do your thing, I'll do my thing, and we'll all be happy. Uh, that's not how it tends to go. So as, as unhappy as you might feel starting a project about having to sit down and figure out uh, what feels like a prenuptial agreement to creating a work together, do it because it'll feel a lot nastier and messier when it comes time it, and it feels like a divorce rather than a prenuptial agreement. So um, those are my two no, and I things think that come up a lot. So no, I, and yeah. I'm glad you brought that one up, Sandra, because I do feel like with a lot of the creators that we work with, you know, they're, they're, they're always saying, you know, Kim, the, there's nothing that kills a vibe more, right? A collaborative yeah. vibe than for everyone to say, hey, how do we want to split up this? How do we want to navigate copyright? Um, but I always replied with, well, what, what a wonderful world it would be if that wasn't a vibe kill. 
and maybe, you know, the more we just keep integrating um, concepts and, and um, terms of intellectual property and copyright into creative spaces, I'm hoping that it will just be a natural, you know, um, instinct to then start right. thinking about these things. Uh, I mean, and it doesn't have to be a vibe kill, right? It, it, why isn't the conversation, hey, let's talk about all mm -hmm. the cool things that we can do with this work when we've created mm -hmm. it. Like, what causes do we want to support with it? You know, what what positive do we want to do out in the world with this work once we've created it? You know, people don't need to think about it in negative terms, right? That's right. That's right. Yeah. I, I, I would just jump in and say, uh, right when you were discussing um, your first point, I was writing down collaboration because, I mean, I think from the copyright office perspective, that's something that we see a lot, especially when it comes to, like, the registration and some of the issues that come up. Because when we give registration applications, you know, sometimes when there are multiple authors involved, people begin to disagree about who the actual owner is or somebody who is engaged a person or they work together and they don't realize that this person has done a sufficient amount of creative um, contributions to this work to arise to the level of co-authorship or whatever the case may be. We get a lot of qu questions about that from our um, public side and then also on our registration side we just see it in the, in the records. People will write notes oh, this person helped me out, but they're not an author, or this, you know, so we have to ask questions about those things. We have to get more information. Ultimately, we accept the facts of what the person is telling us, but we, we can just see that this is something that people haven't necessarily always worked through, and sometimes it comes out in their copyright registration or the questions that they ask the copyright office. Um, and then to add to that, another issue that we see from the copyright office perspective is people who do choose to engage in the registration system, um, not taking advantage of the office as a resource before they you know, start the process. We have a public information office full of people who are very knowledgeable about our processes and our applications and our systems and all of our services really. And we would encourage people to call us and ask us questions if they have them, or even if you don't think you have them, you know, just sort of like, to get more information about the process, to get more information um, about registration or about record agent or whatever it is that you want to do engaging any of the office's services because sometimes, you know, we see that things are done incorrectly and it's like if you would have called the office before you started that, you didn't, you didn't necessarily need to call a, a lawyer to help you or pay somebody. You can call the copyright office. We have people who can answer your questions and they can help you uh, with these applications or with these services, and then you save yourself some time, either through waiting for office correspondence, perhaps you save yourself some money by avoiding a refusal for something that was really, you know, sort of like a procedural or an eligibility issue that could have been avoided had you just called us. Um, I don't want to sound like a <laughs> wagging my finger here, but, you know, I, just, I do encourage people to, you know, call us, talk to us, uh, we can answer some of your questions. We can't give you legal advice. We can't tell you, um, you know, specifics about your specific case and how the law would apply there, but we can give you general information. We can help guide you, especially through some of our services that we offer. And I think the people, some of the people who do that, who don't have other help and other counsel, um, they find, um, at least from the feedback what, that we hear anecdotally, they're very grateful. They, you know, they reply and they say, thank you, this helped. I was able to do this much easier um, and those types of things. So that's one thing I would just point out. Not calling us, <laughs> not reaching out to us, because we're here to help. That's great. And uh, so I have, I actually had a, a whole list of questions I wanted to ask these ladies today because they are so fantastic. But I have been watching the chats and I'm seeing there's a couple of questions that have popped up. So we're going to do the easiest to answer first and then um, the second is on fair use, which should be a lot of fun. Um, but one of the questions that I saw pop up um, was just giving folks, Jalen, could you give, a, give folks a sense of how much registering would be for um, like registering some of your copyright? Yeah. So we have different registration options. Um, the general standard application that's going to pretty much apply to most works and most things that people want to register 
is a $65 application. But we also have some group registration options that could apply to certain groups of related work. So for visual artists here, we have a group photograph options, two options where you can register a group of published photographs or a group of unpublished photographs with one application. Then we also have a uh, what we call a group, G-R-U-W, group registration of unpublished work. That's another option where you can register up to 10 work with a single application, and those will also be for that same um, fee. I would have to double check the fees because we actually just um, had a fee change in March, and so I'm still catching up with the exact numbers, but I'll, I'll, I will definitely get back to you. Yeah. But it's between $65 and $85 is about what registration is going to um, cost. Okay. And it's particularly great for photographers. I, I yeah. work with a lot of photographers. And I mean, if you're going out and shooting an event or, mm -hmm. uh, you know, if you're a professional photographer, you're shooting so many images that if you were to pay for individual registrations, it right. would just be cost prohibitive. So, Right. And yeah. then, so another question, I noticed this from... Prudence, and she was talking about, you know, that she's a, a collage artist, and um, she asked the question, you know, if someone photocopies your work that's available online, is that fair use? And I would say the quick answer is no, but I wanted to let Professor um, Stars set us up for a conversation, kind of frame up a conversation on free, of, of fair use. Yeah. So, I mean, fair use is a conversation that we could have for, you yeah. know, like an entire <laughs> class session or two, and, and that's what we do. But, um, it, you know, the sometimes what I say to, to artists is, you know, treat fair use sort of as the golden rule. Um, you know, it, um, think about how you would feel if somebody used your work the way you're proposing to use somebody else's work. Um, and then be very honest, <laughs> because it's not just like, oh, I think this is fair, you know, um, I should be able to use it this way. The courts have four factors that they evaluate um, together in order to make a determination about whether a use is fair or not. And, um, you know, those factors include the amount of uh, a work that is being used, the nature of the work that's being used, whether it's primarily factual or creative, um, the, uh, the um, effect on the marketplace of the, uh, for the work that's being used, um, the uh, nature of the use, whether it's a commercial use or uh, you know, more of an educational or, or nonprofit use. Not, not any of these factors is determinative in and of itself. They're taken all together. Um, and then there's this, this other kind of overarching um, sort of new factor that's emerged through case law over the years that people refer to as transformative use, which is, you know, have you added something kind of new and transformative to the work, injected some new meaning into the work um, that wasn't there before. Um, and uh, that's, you know, that's also something that the courts might look at. So, I mean, it's a complicated analysis on the one hand, um, if you're talking about something that's a very, that it's, that's a creative work. On the other hand, I mean, if you're talking about works of nonfiction, it's sometimes much less, uh, you know, challenging. I think it's actually easier for, say, a documentary filmmaker to make a determination about um, whether a, a work, what, whether what they're proposing to do with the work is fair use or not. Um, uh, you know, in terms of folks like appropriation artists and collage artists, yeah, I mean, fair use is what you're relying on day to day in your work. Um, and there's, you know, there are collage artists like Rauschenberg on the one hand, and then there are people, you know, um, like 
you know, Richard Prince, on the other hand, <laughs> you know, who are putting blue lozenges on, uh, you know, uh, photographs of Rastafarian who, you know, which were taken from another artist's, um, uh, you know, coffee table book. Um, and the question is, you know, is that transformative enough to qualify as fair use? And that was an actual case. And the court that evaluated it said some of the images were transformed enough and some were not. So even with a single artist's use of another artist's images in a um, supposedly transformative, supposedly transformative way, way, the court came up with different uh, answers about different images. So you can see that it's it can become challenging. Um, I'm not sure that I'm, I'm giving an answer that's going to be very useful as a guiding line more than what I started out saying, which is really kind of treated as a, as the golden rule and be honest about <laughs> what you're doing and, and how it, you know, how it feels. Um, there's, and remember, a fair use is a defense to infringement. So you're not going to get to a place where you're asserting fair use unless you're copying from somebody else's work and somebody is challenging that copying. So, um, it, you know, it, it, it's, it's there for a purpose. It's a very important part of copyright law. Um, artists rely on it every day. If it wasn't there, we would have a huge gap in our ability to create and to build on each other's works and to have a vibrant culture and to engage with each other. Um, but it's also something that we can't weaponize. Uh, you know, so use it respectfully is, I guess, my, <laughs> my charge to all of you uh, when you use it. So, and then, so Cheryl just pointed out an interesting example of how um, Hank Willis Thomas used the MasterCard logo um, in one of his works. Um, and she was asking, you know, d does that fall under, or let's talk a little bit about how that does fall under fair use or transparency. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that, that's kind of, that's mixing two things, right? Because the, the there's another, uh, another doctrine of fair use that applies also to trademark logos, but mm -hmm. let's just talk about it, leaving the trademark issues aside. Um, you know, I, I think I would argue that using um, a corporate logo in a work of art, um, you know, you're making a social commentary, presumably, on the corporate logo. And therefore, you know, that is um, necessary to your, you know, the use of the logo is necessary to your social commentary in the work of art. And that's your fair, you know, that's presumably your fair use argument um, to justify, to justify the use. So, Thanks, Sandra. Okay, so we have one last question. Um, and so this one's interesting too. So Araspo, I'm sorry if I said that wrong. Um, the question is, are there any copyright issues connected to painting the likeness of a public figure and then selling and reselling copies of that work? Sorry, what, what was the question? Are there any copyright issues connected to painting the likeness of a public figure? So there are issues, you know, related to uh, right of publicity, um, which is a related, an issue related to copyright. It's not purely a copyright issue, but it's one that people consider together with copyright issues. Um, and right of publicity 
arises if you're talking about public figures um, you know there's there are two types of uh, people think about right of publicity and then they think about right of privacy right and it depends on the state because this is not a federal law this is a state by state issue um, so it makes it even more complicated for an artist to navigate um, and it depends on which state the person lives in or if you're talking about a person who has died the state in which the person has died um, which law will apply and um, ultimately if you're talking about a public figure the question is has the person been public enough not known enough to have acquired a commercial interest in their likeness um, and uh, you know are you it's such that the likeness would be um, you know something of of value that that you would be commercializing so um, you know you that you would normally have to seek permission to use so for instance you can't use it to um, you know to endorse products or or so forth there have been lines and lines of cases where people have used celebrities or like you know celebrity look-alikes or even you know robots that sound like celebrities or you know celebrity catchphrases um, on various things that have been found to violate the right um, but it, it, you know it's a it's a question where you really need more facts and circumstances to give a straight answer so yes you need to think about those issues you need to know which state the, the who the celebrity is which state they're um, in and know what the law is because they vary across across states and i think can i ask a question or kind of throw a wrinkle in that um for our consideration especially with you know artists or visual creators who may find their inspiration in lots of things especially when it comes to people um you might have some type of copyright considerations if you created your image based off of another image, even though it is a person or their likeness. So that would be something I would just, you know, give us something to think about is like, are you actually looking at that person and creating this image that's your own expression or are you looking at somebody else's created expression of this image? It can get, you know, down the, you know, kind of right, like there. the that's shepherd that's something fairy. to think about. Right like the hope mm -hmm. the obama hope poster um, exactly. and the shepherd fairy example so the photograph um and that was never actually litigated because of non-copyright related mm -hmm. issues um and um uh, so we don't know we don't know the answer to that question ultimately right. but yes um the, there was uh, uh that, that is definitely a, a question to be very attuned to. Well, that is fantastic. And I feel like every time, I, I feel like I could just sit here and listen to you guys just kind of talk about these issues um, all day. <laughs> um, but I want to be respectful of your time. So I want to thank you both for coming. Um, this has been fantastic. Everybody who came in, thank you so much for taking the time. I'm always ecstatic whenever I see folks, especially in creative spaces. Um, ready to have these conversations about intellectual property. And I'm always grateful to my colleagues and friends because they always make it super interesting. Um, we'll be doing another conversation next week about copyright and music. Um, and so we'll do that Wednesday at noon as well. So I hope you guys join us again. Um, and I'm going to be working with um, our host today to make sure that you guys get a copy of all these great links that Sandra and Jalen um, provided for us. So thanks everybody. Thank you all. For thank you. And thank you thank to you. our wonderful interpreter. We appreciate you. Yes, thank you to our interpreter. Thank you all. All right, bye everybody. Thank bye. you.